Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this afternoon session. Um, I'm Xiaomeng Liu, a postdoc in Gastani's lab at Princeton. I'm one of the organizers of this summer school and uh, will be moderator of this afternoon's session. So we encourage you to save the questions to the end of the talk, but if you want to ask questions during the talk, you can tap it into the Q&A box uh, underneath uh, the screen, and I will be picking some of the questions at proper times to ask uh, Professor Jacobi. So we are honored today to have uh, Professor Amir Jacobi from Howard, Uni Howard Uni University to give us uh, this afternoon session's talk. Professor uh, Jacobi's lab is a lead leading group in many directions of condensed matter physics. Uh, this, this includes semiconductor qubits, uh, NV centers, and interacting systems in graphene and other 2D materials, as well as topological superconductors. So results from uh, Amir Yakovsky's lab often struck me as very uh, clever designs. And I think this topic he's going to present us today is a very good example of that. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Professor Yakobi to tell us about magnets in, in, in strongly correlated materials. Uh, Professor Yakobi, please go ahead. So thank you. Let me uh, first share the screen here. All right, so um, first I'd like to start by thanking uh, the organizers of this summer school uh, for inviting me, giving me this opportunity to tell you about some of the recent work we've been doing to use magnons both uh, as interesting elementary excitation of strongly correlated matter, but also to use them as novel probes of strongly correlated physics. Uh, now, you might ask, why do we need new probes of strongly correlated physics? After all, we already have quite a large variety of uh, quite amazing tools uh, that allow us to probe strongly correlated matter. So I'd like to start by presenting just a few slides, which are uh, a random selection of topics from the past decade or so that I think will highlight why uh, developing new probes is an interesting direction that should continue as it fosters also new discoveries um, and allows us to uh, explore materials with a different uh, perspective. So starting from ground state properties of various materials, I show here three examples. Um, for example, we're all familiar with topological superconductors. Here on the upper right, I show a two-dimensional topological superconductor sorry, topological insulator that consists of a quantum well that is gapped in the bulk and has conducting edge states along its boundaries uh, such that there is one spin species flowing in one direction and another spin species flowing in the other direction. So obviously these two currents cancel each other in equilibrium. So in the ground state of the system, it carries no current along the edge. But what is peculiar is that in the ground state, this system carries a spin current. And currently I'm not familiar with any technique that would allow us to explore and observe the existence of such a spin current uh, in this system in equilibrium. Another example shown here in the middle uh, is taken from a more recent activity having to do with twisted graphene layers where uh, I'm sure you've heard that some of the phases of twisted graphene correspond to an insulating state. And one of the theoretical proposals for this insulating state is shown here where the ground state carries current plaquettes that are circulating to the left or circulating to the right or not carrying any current altogether. And the length scale here is roughly a unit cell of graphene um, and the magnitude of the currents are weak. And so again here, we don't really have techniques that would allow us to observe the presence of such microscopic currents uh, in this system. Another example that I will touch upon today is again coming from graphene here. Uh, and what you see here is in the strong magnetic field, graphene or uh, 
graphene subject to a very strong magnetic field, when the density is actually zero, it favors a state which is an antiferromagnetic state. Now you can say, well, we do have tools that allow us to explore antiferromagnetism or ferromagnetism, for example, neutron scattering. The problem is that these techniques requires large volumes of materials. And here we have a monolayer. And not only that, the typical length scale of the material here is of order microns. So the volume material is extremely small. And second, the density, the magnetization density in this system corresponds to that of the carriers in the system is about a million times smaller than what you find in normal magnet, magnets. So what happens is that existing techniques are simply incapable of detecting the presence of such uh, order in the system. And so we really need to figure out new ways to know directly that such phases exist in the bulk. Going beyond the ground state of materials, we can think about, well, what are the elementary excitations that live above the ground state? And here I'm just giving, again, two examples out of many. Uh, one is the example of spin liquids. Here we know that there are material candidates that are believed to be uh, spin liquids. You've heard a talk by Juan today uh, about thermal transport and spin liquids. And we know that uh, what we expect for these systems is that the elementary excitations in such a system does not carry charge, but only carry spin. And in fact, these spins behave as fermions. Throughout this talk, I'll talk about spin excitations that are actually bosons, but in spin liquids, they're fermions. And so it would be really desirable to have a technique that can probe the presence of these spin-ons uh, and say something about their underlying properties. Another example of an interesting excitation are non-abelian excitations. These emerge in uh, materials such as topological superconductors. And here again, we really are lacking a variety of techniques to be able to probe the presence of non-abelian statistics. There are some ideas in literature, but they're really hard to implement. And it would be really, again, desirable to find new ways that would allow us to directly confirm or conclude that we have non-abelian particles in our system. Now, lastly, if we go beyond just the existence of excitations, if these excitations are long lived, we can ask, well, what about their transport? Uh, so for example, uh, spin excitations in conventional magnets, they can propagate. Uh, if they're bosonic, they will behave as magnons. These are just spin waves. And it turns out that under certain conditions, and again, I'll talk a little bit more about that throughout the talk, such magnons can condense to form superfluids. And in that case, this, the, the transport of these spin excitations will occur in a dissipationless manner and will uh, uh, extend over very long distances. So this is an interesting problem to explore, but we need tools to be able to create chemical potential differences of, of these magnons or spin excitations, measure currents, et cetera. Again, things that are typically lacking. And another example here is the heat transport uh, which again, we lack a variety of tools to do this on mesoscopic length scales. And here I'm giving an example of heat transport, quantum Hall thermal transport uh, in spin liquids. So overall, I'd say, despite the fact that we have really fantastic measurement capabilities in particular transport and some optical techniques, I think thinking continuously about the possibility of exploring materials in new ways is something that I found always intriguing. And um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing along these directions um, today. So the two lectures that I'll be talking about today will involve two separate topics. The first one will be the exploration of magnon spin waves, basically neutral excitations in the quantum Hall system. Uh, so these are magnons and quantum Hall ferromagnets. And the second lecture, in, uh, just to follow, uh, would be to basically explore the use of such magnons as, an, as a generalized scattering platform. And this will be very clear during the second talk. The techniques that are involved in each one of these experiments are very different. In fact, the first one does use transport experiments. Uh, but allows us to learn something about neutral excitation. And the second one is really about propagation of magnons. All right, so let's begin with quantum Hall physics. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with, uh, to a certain degree, uh, with quantum Hall physics. Integer quantum Hall effect is a single particle phenomena where the system 
develops Landau levels when it's subject to strong magnetic fields. Uh, in the fractional quantum Hall regime, interactions dominate the physics. And it turns out that over the years, over the course of, uh, of, this, uh, of the history of this field, uh, we've learned about a variety of interesting excitations that exist in quantum Hall systems. And here I've listed a few. So up here I have skirmions. These are basically uh, uh, charges that are bound to spin excitation uh, and, uh, and have this kind of interesting textures. Uh, we are familiar with composite fermions. These are charges that are bound to magnetic fluxes. And that's the physics that governs quantum Hall systems around filling factor a half. Uh, we have anions in uh, gapped fractional quantum Hall states like the one third state where the elementary excitations carry as a third of an electron charge. And of course, near half filling, we believe to have non-abelian excitations and in the quantum Hall regime, these are believed to have a charge of E over four. So the interesting thing about these excitations, they're all really quite peculiar, have interesting properties, uh, but they're all charged. And the question is, does quantum Hall system, do quantum Hall systems also have neutral excitations? And in fact, the answer is yes. And here I'm, citing a review paper by Steve Gervin uh, from June of 2000, just the turn of the century. Uh, and this is a review about spins and isospin, exotic order in quantum Hall ferromagnets. And it basically is, is a review about um, spin textures that could exist in quantum Hall systems. And at one point in the article, Steve writes that at filling factor nu equals one, spin waves are the lowest energy excitations. But because they do not carry charge, they do not have a large impact on the electrical transport properties. So to some extent, since the discovery of quantum Hall physics, uh, the exploration of neutral excitation has been extremely limited. Only you know, a very tiny small number of papers have addressed these neutral excitations. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is that quantum Hall systems are gapped in the bulk. So when you probe them using the charged excitation, you're basically probing a property that lives along the edge. You're not really probing the bulk property of the system. And so we were really looking hard to see whether we can have ways of exciting the bulk neutral excitation of the system. And at the end, we stumbled upon uh, a technique that turns out to be extremely effective in exploring that. So let me uh, just briefly review quantum Hall physics in graphene. So here, what I'm showing on the left is the spectrum of graphene. These are uh, relativistic electrons, linear dispersion of energy versus momentum. And one subject to a strong magnetic field, the continuum density of states uh, evolves into these Landau levels where today I'll focus only on the N equals zero Landau level, the one that uh, is pinned to zero energy. And despite the fact that in the absence of magnetic field, the density of states at zero energy is actually zero, very, very small. Uh, in the presence of magnetic field, there is a large density of states uh, shown here by this N equals zero Landau level. And I just remind you that in graphene, we have fourfold degenerate states because we have two possible spins and two possible valleys. And in the lowest Landau level, uh, one could substitute the notation of valley with sublattice. Turns out that the wave functions in the lowest Landau level actually uh, prefer to sit either in sublattice A or in sublattice B and sublattice and valley becomes basically uh, identical. So I will be switching between them primarily using the sublattice uh, description of the, uh, of the uh, degree of freedom, the second degree of freedom uh, in addition to spin. Now imagine that we want to fill up this uh, Landau level, but only to a quarter filling. So we want to fill only one quarter of all the possible states that exist within this fourfold degenerate Landau level. And so we could assume a, a, an equality type of an approach where it says, well, we're going to fill, you know, in equal amounts, each one of these possible Landau levels, the spin up one, the spin down, the sublattice A, the sublattice B, we have four flavors here, and we're gonna fill out each one of them to a quarter degree, such that four of these give us a total filling of a quarter. Turns out the Coulomb interaction really do not favor doing it that way, uh, 
And the Coulomb interaction would favor actually filling out one Landau level completely and leaving the other three empty. And this is because it reduces the exchange interaction in the system when the electrons have the same quantum numbers, Pauli basically prevents them from overlapping from one another and this lowers their Coulomb interaction. And so the lowest state given that these systems are emerging in a strong magnetic field obviously would be to occupy spin states that are pointing along the magnetic field direction. And then which sublattice they select is arbitrary. Here I'm showing, for example, that the nu equals minus one state uh, corresponding to only one out of the four filled or the nu equals plus one state. And the reason this is one and this is minus one is that zero corresponds to two Landau level filled where the density is effectively zero. Uh, and here you see that I've selected these spins to sit on one particular sublattice, sublattice A. Now, what I want you to, to note is that this ground state is actually a ferromagnet. So a ferromagnet is a system where all spins are pointing in the same direction because of some interacting uh, physics. And uh, this system actually has all the properties of a conventional ferromagnets. The only difference is that its density is extremely low. The density of magnetization here is very, very low, about a million times smaller than what you'd find in a conventional magnet. So just a few words about well, what are the excitations of the magnet? And here you see, I'm not talking at all about edge states. These are the bulk of the system. It's magnetic. It's a magnetic insulator, if you like. There are no charge degrees of freedom and there are only spin degrees of freedom that can live in the bulk. So some of the excitations that exist in a magnet uh, are magnons. These are spin waves. You can imagine all the spins kind of pointing in the same direction and wiggling just like uh, wheat moving in, in, in wind, each, each plant is pushing one on its neighbor, and this gives us uh, waves that can propagate across the sample. Uh, in the presence of a magnetic field or any anisotropy, it turns out that the spectrum of excitations of these spin waves have a gap, and the gap is shown here. Uh, if the system is not is isotropic, then the magnetic field itself defined the anisotropy because the spins do prefer pointing along the magnetic field direction. And the gap is characterized by something that's called the Kittel law shown here where the frequency, the energy associated with the gap is G mu times B, but corrected by the intrinsic magnetization. So for mag conventional magnets, you see that uh, the spin gap at zero magnetic field, there is no spin gap, but then it rises faster than Zeeman and then it basically approaches uh, a slope of the Zeeman gap G mu B. But because in graphene, the magnetization is very, very small, we're gonna neglect this M and you see that the spin gap energy, basically it means that the spin gap energy, the minimum energy for exciting a long wavelength magnon is just the bare Zeeman energy. And for those of you who are a little bit familiar with quantum Hall physics, you know that typically energy gaps in quantum Hall systems are not the bare Zeeman energy, but they're enhanced by exchange. I already mentioned that this nu equals one quantum Hall state is one that favors having all the electrons in one Landau level filled and the other empty simply because it can reduce its Coulomb interaction, which means that adding another charge to the system will cost more than just flipping a spin because we need to pay this penalty of the Coulomb interaction. Well, for the spin excitations, we don't have any Coulomb energy to pay because the lowest energy excitation is a collective motion of all spins. They're all still parallel to one another. They're just not pointing along the magnetic field direction. And that's why the spin gap is precisely the gap of the bare, um, spin, the bare Zeeman energy. And this is extremely important because this will be a telltale for us that we're actually observing the neutral excitation in the system and not charged excitation. All charge excitation have energies that are on the scale of the exchange energy. The spin excitations will have an energy scale on the scale, at least the lower energy uh, boundary limit is that of the bare Zeeman energy. All right, so, so far we talked about the ferromagnetic phases, nu equals one, nu equals minus one here. Uh, what about nu equals zero? So nu equals zero is a situation we want to fill up two Landau levels and leave the other two empty. And again, there are many, many possibilities of which to, to choose. And the question is, is there any energetic uh, reason to prefer one over the other? So I just remind you that basically we have two degrees of freedom 
uh, the spin and the sublattice. And in principle, each one of these degrees of freedom uh, describes an SU2 sphere. And in fact, the full space that characterizes the, the possible symmetries identified in each one of these systems is not SU2 cross SU2, namely considering the spin and sublattice separately, but in fact SU4, which is a bigger space. And you'll see this in just a minute, but let's first just play around and see what possible ground states could exist. So here, for example, I'm considering a ferromagnetic nu equals zero state, which means I'm occupying the two Landau levels with the same spin. And this means that their valley degree of freedom, the red hours, one must sit on sublattice A and the other one must sit on sublattice B. So it's basically a sublattice singlet. And you see that all the electrons here in real space are pointing in the same direction along the field direction. And they're occupying both sublattice A and sublattice B. And this is a ferromagnetic state, very similar to the nu equals one or minus one state that we described before. But we can consider actually occupying both Landau levels with the same sublattice. So let's select sublattice A. In this case, we must choose the opposite spins because otherwise we're gonna, these states are not gonna be orthogonal. So this is actually a charge density wave because all the charge is sitting on one sublattice and not on the other. So there's a real space order uh, and it's a spin singlet. So there is no magnetization to this state. So this is another candidate ground state. We can imagine not sitting specifically on sublattice A, but actually choosing a superposition of sublattice A and B, which means now our sublattice arrow is pointing along the equator and note that this symmetry, this system now breaks a symmetry spontaneously because it selects a particular phase arbitrarily. And this means that it's gonna have some Goldstone modes associated with this possible order. But again, it's a spin singlet and it's a charge density order, if you like, and it's called Kekule. It turns out that amongst all these states, there are even others that, because each one of these is again, a state that exists in SU2 cross SU2. But it turns out by, after following some beautiful work by Kairatonov, that actually the ground state of the system is a antiferromagnet in SU4 space, where the spins actually favor to point perpendicular to the magnetic field. So they're actually in the plane and not along the magnetic field direction. And they're pointing along one direction on one sublattice and pointing in the other direction along the other sublattice. So this is an antiferromagnet in both spin and sublattice. And note that the presence of the external magnetic field will favor the spins to cant a little bit out of the plane to gain a tiny bit of Zeeman without paying much exchange. And so what is believed to be, and there have been some beautiful transport experiments uh, that have been done to probe the, the, the consequences of these kind of phases, uh, is that the nu equals zero ground state, in fact, is an antiferromagnetic phase. And you see now here, the spins are in the plane. They're canted a little bit out of the plane, but they sit on each one of the sublattices. And one sublattice has spins pointing in one direction, the other sublattice is, is having spins pointing in the other direction. So what I find really remarkable about this system is that you see that these are two magnetic phases, a ferromagnetic state and an antiferromagnetic state, and they're just tunable by a gate. So I'm not very familiar with many material systems that actually have electrically tunable magnetic order. So this is one of the appeal of trying to explore these quantum hall ferromagnets because within the same system, we can probe uh, different magnetic order. And in fact, we can explore interfaces between one magnetic phase and another, for example. Second, spin generally is not a good quantum number. If you have, for example, spin orbit interaction, spin angular momentum can easily be relaxed to uh, linear momentum to lattice uh, through uh, electron phonon interaction. But graphene has really very weak spin orbit interaction. So this is a very promising candidate to study some really interesting physics associated with spin excitation. And I've already mentioned some of this, which is the spin superfluidity that does require very long lived spin excitations. And there are a few others that have been predicted. Uh, for example, universal Peltier and Zbeck coefficients for spin transport. So if we had the ways of 
generating these spin excitations and probing their propagation, uh, I think we can explore some really interesting physics associated with these uh, collective phenomena uh, described in, in various papers in recent years. All right, so now we know that we should expect these neutral excitations. Steve Gervin is telling us we shouldn't be able to see them because they're neutral and they're not gonna make any dent on transport experiments. So the question is how can we overcome these limitations? And I'm gonna give you a schematic or a very simple illustration of what's going on in our experiments that actually allows us to probe this physics. So imagine here a quantum Hall system uh, contacted by two electrodes here in yellow. One is biased to mu, the other one is zero. The bulk of the system is set to nu equals one. So this is a very kind of simple two terminal quantum Hall system. We have two chiral edge states, each spin polarized because this is a ferromagnet. And we know that the conductance of this system is going to be precisely one uh, in the absence of any backscattering. And if the system is large enough, this backscattering is exponentially small. We're gonna get very large, beautiful, very nice quantized conductance for both nu equals one and for nu equals minus one. Suppose we now engineer the system to have regions of nu equals two near the contacts. These are not gonna change anything in the transport properties of these systems because this chemical potential that feeds the nu equals two edge here is basically folded upon itself. It doesn't carry any current from left to right and the same here with the right one, which means that the conductance is still gonna be given precisely by one. This could be easily realized in graphene by having, for example, a top gate and a separate back gate. This is, allows us to tune the densities in each one of these regions separately very, very easily. And I wanna emphasize that the nu equals two regions, these are paramagnet. All states are filled at nu equals two, which means that by definition, this state carries no spin angular momentum or lattice, uh, lattice polarization whatsoever. It's kind of a very boring state. Let's now focus at what happens when these edges here, the inner edge and the outer edge, and note the inner edge carries the opposite spin species when they meet. What happens here is that there is a chemical potential difference between this inner edge that comes in at mu and the outer edge that comes in at zero. And here I'm showing how these edge states, they disperse upwards because of the boundary of the sample. And one is at chemical potential mu, the other one is chemical potential zero. And we see that there are available states for these two edges to equilibrate. Now, in principle, charge can hop from one Landau level to the other to equilibrate because there are available states, but note, the nature of the states in the outer edge are the opposite spin. So for this to happen, spin must be flipped. And experiments both in gallium arsenide and in graphene have shown that edge states that have different spins do not mix for very, very long distances. And the reason is again, because there isn't really anything that will carry the angular momentum, will, will basically conserve angular momentum. There are very few nuclear spins. The edge, there are no dangling electrons along the edge that uh, will allow for this kind of flip, flip spin. So overall, spin is a very good and conserved quantity and for tens and even hundreds of microns, an, a, a, a non-equilibrium state shown here will persist. But now what happens if we exceed the minimum energy for exciting a spin-on or a magnetic excitation, a magnon in the bulk of the system? So here again, I'm showing that spin down and the bulk, if I have my edge channel spin down, the bulk is all spin up. I can't flip a spin when mu is below the spin gap energy, which is the bare Zeeman energy. But if the chemical potential exceeds the Zeeman energy, suddenly I can take this down electron spin and flip it up and take all the spins of the magnet and cant them a little bit, basically, transferring one unit of angular momentum, extracting one magnon, one H bar from the fully polarized bulk, which means that it's slightly less polarized now, I've excited a magnon in the system. This would only happen above the Zeeman energy where there we will have uh, the ability to excite the bulk. So in principle, for example, in this geometry, minus here indicates where the chemical potential uh, here, the bias applied to this contact is negative. Uh, at this particular coherent, we believe that if we exceed 
the Zeman energy, we should be able to flip spins and equilibrate the two edges and thereby launch magnons into the bulk. The problem, however, is that if we look at this edge, the fact that the charge has redistributed between these two edges is again not going to affect the conductance whatsoever, because in any case, all the carriers are going back to the left contact, and so the net conductance is not going to change. We're not going to notice this. In order to notice that we have bulk magnons, these magnons must be absorbed. And there are three corners in, in which they can in principle, uh, in principle get absorbed. If they absorb on this corner here, they're gonna take some charge from the outer edge and move them to the inner edge, which means we're gonna get less current going from left to right. And that means that the conductance will drop. If they get absorbed on the upper corner here on the right, we're gonna take an outer electron move them to the inner, which means that now we have less returning current, which means that our overall we get more forward going current. And so the conductance is gonna increase. And lastly, if they get absorbed at this corner here, nothing is gonna happen because again, the direction of motion of these two edge states is in the same direction and redistribution of charge doesn't matter. So we learn here that in principle, if we have magnons that are generated at the upper left corner and these magnons get propagates through the bulk and get absorbed at another corner, we might be able to see a change in conductance. Now you might ask, well, this corner here also have a mis uh, an imbalance of chemical potential between outer edge and inner edge. And in principle, you can ask, well, why can't I have spin up going down and flipping their spin going to this lower chemical potential inner edge. And the reason is that that would require polarizing the bulk even further. Whereas this process demagnetizes the bulk, this one will magnetize the bulk. And because we're starting with a very strongly magnetized phase, this process is gonna be very weakly allowed. Sorry, I'm now, I could just interrupt you with a question here. Of course, uh, yeah. Someone is asking how sensitive is the magnetization of the graphene edge to disorders? Uh, so I think it's not very sensitive, uh, you know, because anyway, electrons are strongly localized into the system. And so, um, you know, if, if, if you have a localized state where the Lando level is kind of a little bit lower in energy than its surrounding, still, the electron that wants to occupy that state would have the same spin as its neighbors. Otherwise, there is a penalty associated with uh, the Coulomb interaction. In addition to Zeeman, I need to flip a spin, but there is uh, a, um, an addition to the, uh, there is a penalty in the Coulomb interaction. So, so generally the quantum Hall phases um, are not so susceptible to disorder. In fact, to see very good quantization of quantum Hall phases, you want this order, but it doesn't destroy the ferromagnetism. Okay, thank you. All right, so we talked about the negative bias which launches magnons on the left. I just point out that if we switch the bias now and apply the bias to the right side, then magnons, it turns out, get generated on the bottom right corner here. Uh, and then the absorption uh, will affect, depending on where they get absorbed, will, will affect the conductance. So here is a measurement, an example of a measurement, where you see that as a function of bias along the x-axis and the y-axis is conductance, for low bias, we get nu equals one. Once we exceed the bayer zeeman energy, we see for negative bias, the conductance drops, which tells us that these magnons get primarily absorbed at the bottom left corner here. And when we switch the bias and we look at the positive bias, we see the conductance drops again, which means that now we're launching magnons on the right and they get primarily absorbed on the corner up on the right. So this is interesting because the way the conductance drops tells us where these magnons are propagating. And it turns out we could actually control this. So we've designed examples, samples that have different geometries. And you see here the different geometries uh, the one that I've shown before is a narrow and long hall bar such that negative bias gets absorbed at the bottom here, positive on the top right. This leads to a drop in conductance in both bias directions. But if we have a trapezoidal kind of geometry, you see that both negative and positive will favor getting absorbed at this corner because the distance to this corner from the generation sites is the smallest. 
And therefore, the conductance is going to increase in one direction and actually decrease in the other. And we can see it very nicely. And lastly, if we change the aspect ratio, we can make sure that the conductance wants to increase in both directions. And this is what is shown here. And just pay attention here only to the onset of the phenomena. What happens beyond the onset is something that I'll talk a little bit later, but is something that largely we don't really understand. Uh, now, just to kind of be totally convinced that this is a, uh, a Zeeman effect and not an exchange effect, the exchange interaction is proportional to the perpendicular magnetic field, whereas the Zeeman is proportional to the total magnetic field. So we've conducted experiments at an angle to see along which magnitude of magnetic field is the onset of the conductance deviations that we see. And you can see it follows the outer boundaries that correspond to the total magnetic field and not the perpendicular magnetic field. So this was a very, very strong confirmation, again, that this is a bear zeeman effect that is therefore a, uh, the magnon uh, a result of magnons and the fact that they must propagate through the bulk in order to affect conductance tells us that we're actually exciting things in the bulk and not only near the edge. Uh, I also want to Could point out the magnitude uh, of this phenomena. Uh, Question? Counter often got stuck on a screen, just to let you know. Oh, the slides get stuck occasionally? This is the slide mostly moving fine, but the pointer is you really oh. stay at one place and he'll jump to the next. So, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So I will move it less. <laughs> um, I want to point out also that the drop in conductance that you can see in the color map can reach a magnitude of up to 0.6. And this means that nearly every magnon. So it basically means that nearly every electron that jumps from one edge to the other launches a magnon that then gets absorbed. It's not a weak effect. It's a very, very strong effect. It's kind of a first order effect. All right. So once we understand the process of generating magnons, we can now start to do a little bit more clever experiments. And this is already now using magnons to probe the bulk properties and magnetic order of various phases in quantum Hall systems. So up to now, we basically learned about our ability to generate these magnons. Now I'm gonna tell you how we can use them to study the properties of other magnetic phases. So how would we do this? So, so far we had only two terminals. We're now adding two voltage probes here on the right. And these are just voltage probes. So we know that if we measure a voltage difference between V1 and V2, that voltage difference is going to be zero in a quantum Hall regime. Now, if the left two contacts exceed Zeeman such that magnons are generated, uh, what's going to happen is that in principle, these magnons can propagate and they can again get absorbed near the voltage contacts. If they're propagating long distances, in principle, they can get absorbed. And what's going to happen is that they're going to affect the current balance details of each contact, right? If we look, for example, about this process here, if we take an electron that leaves this, sorry, if we take, let's say, the bottom right corner, and we take an electron from the outer edge and move it to the inner edge, what's going to happen is that the current coming into contact two is suddenly going to be smaller which means that it needs to change its potential in order to extract a lower current up on the left corner. So the fact that these voltage contacts, even though there is no net current flowing through them, the absorption of magnons at these contacts will affect the voltage. And so we can measure far away from the generation sites, very non-locally, the presence of magnons. So this opens up really some interesting possibilities where we're going to now do a generation of magnons on the left side of the sample, left to this gate TG2. And we're going to measure the non-local voltage on the right between contacts four and five. And we're going to see, basically, we're going to now change the phase of this middle region. So we're going to do a scattering experiment. We're going to launch magnons on the left. And we're going to ask, do these magnons pass through this gated region to reach our contacts on the right? Of course, 
when this gated region is at nu equals one, they will get there. But what happens if that filling factor in the middle is filling factor minus one or minus two or zero or two? So we have a lot and fractional as well. So we can ask, well, what phases will support the bulk propagation of magmas? All right, so first the sanity check. Let's look just at the two terminal conductance on the left. So here we're just biasing between L2 and L3. And we're looking at the two terminal conductance as we vary the voltage on the gate TG2. And you see that not much is happening. And this is a good sign because the gate is far away. Magnons are being generated at the contacts two and three. And the conductance between these two contacts is affected by the presence of magnons, but it doesn't care about what's happening very far away. And just to orient you, I'm going to put here some lines to identify what is the phases underneath the gate uh, for various voltages. So far on the left here, you see nu equals minus two under the green gate, and then it goes to minus one, nu equals zero, plus one and plus two, and plus one corresponds to the situation where the system is completely unimpeded because obviously the entire system is nu equals one. So now let's see what the non-local voltage shows. So on the bottom panel is a measurement showing what happens to the non-local signal as a function of the gate voltage. So first note that when the bias is below Zeeman, nothing is happening. So in the middle here near zero bias, there is really nothing happening. But once we exceed Zeeman, we see a strong signal. The signal is asymmetric. It's positive on one bias, negative on the other. From what we know already about what this means, this basically says that magnons are always absorbed at the same contact more strongly than on the other one. So remember, changing the bias changes where magnons are generated, either the minus sign here or the plus sign on the left panel. If they always get preferably absorbed at contact four because it's closer, this is gonna to lead to an asymmetric response that we show in the bottom plot. All right, now let's look at what happens far to the right. So nu equals one is where my pointer is right now. Hopefully it, it's gonna jump there at some point. Uh, and that's nu equals one. Nu equals one is the situation where the system is uniform. And so we're not changing the phase underneath the gate. If we go to the right of nu equals one, we now have nu equals two, which is shown here as NM, this is non-magnetic. And so magnons can't penetrate this paramagnetic state. It, it doesn't support any magnetic excitations and we see a strong suppression of the signal. The remaining signal we believe has to do with a small nu equals one phase that exists between the nu equals two bulk phase and the boundary. When we go to nu equals zero, which is the middle region, we see overall a strongly suppressed region. And I'll talk more about nu equals zero at these bias ranges. So up to six millivolts or so, we don't see magnons generated in the nu equals zero canted antiferromagnetic phase. And this is a puzzle because the canted antiferromagnetic phase should support magnetic excitations. It's slightly canted, which means it has a ferromagnetic component. And these, this ferromagnet can fluctuate a little bit to support these magnetic excitations, uh, but we don't see it at low bias. So this requires an explanation. Another very interesting result is what happens at nu equals minus one. So look on the upper right panel on the left plot. That's the nu equals minus one. You see how the edge states arrange themselves. So you see we have counter propagating edge states along the left side and yet the nu equals minus one is in principle a different ferromagnetic phase than the nu equals one state and yet magnons propagate freely from nu equals one to nu equals minus one. This was a surprise but once we understood the ordering of the Landau levels uh, it started making sense. So to explain the nu equals minus one to nu equals one coupling let's look at how the Landau levels must be filled in order to support this. So on the left here, I'm showing nu equals one, namely three Landau levels occupied, one empty. And on the right here, I'm showing the region where we have only nu equals 
plus a minus one, only one Landau level filled and the other one, the other three are empty. If we select the value of sublattice and spin quantum numbers in the way that's plotted here, namely A up or K up, B down or K prime down, K prime up and then K down, what we see is that the inner two Landau levels are of the same value or sublattice and they form a spin singlet. So from a magnetic perspective, they are inert. And this means that the nu equals one phase is a ferromagnet of a spin up and the nu equals minus one phase is a ferromagnet precisely of the same species spin up. And so magnons can in principle propagate completely unimpeded across this interface if it's sharp enough such that we don't have a nu equals zero emerging in the middle. And that's what we see. We see very, very strong similarity between nu equals minus one and the nu equals one suggesting that magnons don't care about this interface at all. So now I'm gonna turn and focus on the nu equals zero region. So I'm gonna zoom in in gate voltage to a very small range near nu equals uh, zero, extending a little bit to nu equals minus one and plus one. So we're gonna go roughly from minus 0.5 volts to zero so that we focus only on the nu equals zero phase and we're gonna extend the bias region to much larger bias. And this is what we find. So on the left and on the right, you see the nu equals minus one and you see the nu equals one. And here, another puzzle has emerged. Back on the last, oh, okay, back here now. Oh, thank you. So this is the zoom in. So much larger bias on the vertical axis and a much narrow range on the horizontal axis. So the, the dashed lines show the nu equals zero region, the left and the right side are nu equals minus one and one. And here you see already another puzzle and that is that once the bias exceeds a certain value, the differential conductance goes back to zero. So it's if the, system, the physics stops, something kills the non-local signal at large bias, and we don't really know what the origin is. One interesting possibility is that the system is developing a spin superfluid state that basically eliminates the voltage difference across the contacts, but this is something that needs yet to be confirmed. But for the nu equals zero region, what you see is that at large enough biases, we do see magnons going through. And we have verified that there is no charge propagation from left to right across the nu equals zero region. So this is really a true bulk propagating state that basically propagates magnons through the nu equals zero region. Uh, and the reason that we need such a large bias in order to occupy the nu equals zero region is because of a phenomenon known as exchange bias. So, what we have here at the interface between the nu equals one region and the nu equals zero, I hope you can now see the inset on the left upper side. Uh, the nu equals one region is a, is a magnetic phase that has a spin gap given by E Zeeman. The nu equals zero state, because it's a canted antiferromagnetic state and the spins are in the plane, their orientation in the plane is arbitrary. So this system breaks symmetry spontaneously and does support Goldstone mode. So in principle, the energy gap for exciting these magnons is very small. But the problem is that at the interface between these two, the spins needs to cant. So they're starting from an up-down state shown in the two Landau levels here. And then they need to cant to, to show a in-plane up-down state. And as they're canting, this system basically is very infavorable in terms of exchange interaction. And there is an exchange gap that is enhanced at the interface. And so in order to populate the excitations in the nu equals zero region, we need to overcome this exchange barrier. And that's why there is a gap here, which is larger and only then can we start populating magnons. All right, lastly, before moving to slightly different measurement technique on the same problem, let me just uh, mention that we now see signatures of these magnetic excitations in fractional quantum Hall states. Here you see a variety of them, filling factor four thirds, filling factor one third, and filling factor two thirds. These are all excitations that occur at Zeeman. 
uh, and these phases are believed to be spin polarized. In fact, the nu equals two thirds state is an interesting state where at large magnetic field, it should be spin polarized because there are two composite fermion Landau level occupied and they favor the same spin, but at low magnetic fields, in fact, the system would prefer being spin unpolarized phase. And we were looking for this by monitoring this spin gap as a function of magnetic field. And yes, the gap looks like it's closing at a finite magnetic field of order five Tesla, but we're not yet convinced that this is really due to the phase transition to the unpolarized state, more work will have to be done in order to confirm that. So, so far we've been probing these neutral excitations in the quantum Hall system using effectively a transport technique. We're still monitoring conductance. So what else can we do? So in the remaining, uh, I don't know, five or so minutes, I wanna present a different measurement modality that we've started uh, using and it's, it's you know, raising a lot of puzzles for us. And, but I thought it's fun that I basically just uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, about this technique. So I wanna start by reminding you of, of work that was done at the turn of the century at 2000 by uh, Bob Westervelt at Harvard, where he was looking at electrical transport with a scanning gate technique. And so the technique you can see here in panel A, bottom left, where it's still a transport measurement. There's a left contact, there's a right contact, there's a point contact, which means that current is constrained to move through this constriction. And then there's a tip and the tip is basically a potential barrier. It's biased to some voltage and it's a potential barrier that can move around. Now, of course, if this potential barrier is very far away from the constriction where there is very little current flowing, it's not gonna change the conductance. But if you form this potential barrier precisely at the point contact, then it's gonna reflect a lot of the electrons and the two terminal conductance that you measure will change. So this is still monitoring conductance in the system, but now you can look for changes in conductance depending on where you impede the current by moving your tip and you can get an image. And what you see on the right are images of how the current is flowing. And you see that it's actually quite interesting. Current is flowing in these uh, channels, it's channeled, and you can also see the coherent nature of the electrons because you can develop standing waves depending on where, uh, how, how, how far do the electrons propagate between two scattering centers, for example, the constriction and the tip. So this gives you non, this gives you local information about the current transport in the system uh, by monitoring transport and moving around a barrier. So the question is, can we do the same thing, but this time for neutral excitations? And the answer is yes, because remember, if we change the density of our two deg, for example, to nu equals two, nu equals two is a paramagnet. It's a barrier for magnons. So in principle, by moving a tip around, we can create a barrier for magnons and we can see where are they flowing and thereby convince ourselves, for example, where are they generated, where are they absorbed, et cetera. So on the left, you see a schematic of uh, basically a picture, an optical uh, image of the sample. It has multiple contacts and it has a gate. We're gonna be scanning this, the, the, the white rectangle here. And if you take this white rectangle and our tips are typically more sophisticated than this, just a the gate, they're actually single electron transistors so they can even measure the local electrostatic potential. And what you see on the right is a, uh, electrostatic map of the sample where the large gradients in potential that you see at the edges here correspond to the boundary of the graphene flake. So now what we can do is we can bias our tip a little bit away from nu equals one and see where does the current impede. So here is an example of what happens uh, in such an experiment. So in the middle panel, the bias is below Zeeman. The bottom panel is the conductance that we measure between these two contacts as we move the tip around. And the gray line here outlines the boundary of the sample, which is basically the boundary of the sample shown in each one of the top panels. And what you see that when the bias is below Zeeman, nothing is happening. 
So it doesn't matter where we position our tip, it's not affecting the conductance at all. But when we bias the tip in one direction, namely uh, the bias is uh, here negative. So magnons are launched in the far upper corner and the reduction in conductance is shown by minus and the increase in conductance is shown by plus. You see that indeed, when we place the tip around the generation site and around where the magnons need to be absorbed, we see a change in the phenomena, change in conductance. When we flip the bias, you see that the image changes drastically because now we're launching magnons from a different location. And so the tip will perturb the system at a different location. And note that these ring-like images occur. And this we believe has to do with localized events, localized states that are strongly assisting in the, prop, in the generation and absorption of magnons. And in fact, if we take a line cut through one of these circles here, we see that as we change the density, it's not only one, they're actually, it's a, it's, a, it's a large collection of localized states that reside near the edge. And depending on the tip bias, we can bend the, the, uh, the condition under which they are affecting things to either up or down. So this is something very interesting. It's teaching us about local phenomena that are responsible for the generation and uh, absorption of magnons. And another measurement modality that we're now analyzing intensively is actually using the SET, the single electron transistor, to monitor what the bulk gap is doing. Remember, this is a bulk phenomena. Magnons are occupying the bulk, which means that in the absence of any magnons, the gap is the exchange gap. But when magnons are present, we already have some disorder in spin and meaning that the gap might be smaller. And this is a measurement here. You can see the line cut showing that as a function of the, uh, basically showing that the gap diminishes considerably by a few millivolts as we pump magnons into the bulk. And this is again, something that we're trying to understand uh, uh, very intensively right now. So these are two of the future directions that we're pursuing the, the local properties of magnon transport in quantum Hall systems. So before concluding, let me just say a few things about future directions. So number one, remember these non-local measurements, this plot here up on the right. What I wanna point out is that currently we effectively only understand the onset. We understand that things happen at Zeeman and we understand whether they should go up or down. But once we exceed Zeeman, we're in kind of a highly non-equilibrium state. And I'm just taking here a cross section as a function of filling factor in our probe region to show you that there's a lot of things that are happening as a function of filling fraction and we don't really understand any of this behavior. So there's a lot of things to understand once we exceed Zeeman. Two, uh, we are interested in identifying whether we have perhaps superfluid states. So the vanishing of the signal at large bias is something that's a big puzzle and we need to further understand that. Third, fractional quantum Hall phases, I barely touched upon that. That's kind of an entirely open state. What are the magnetic, possible magnetic excitations in these systems and what are the energy gaps, et cetera, is an interesting problem that we need to explore further. And finally, what I talked about lastly was the local properties using both the scanning gate and the scanning single electron transistor to pick out what the local, local properties are. So with this, let me just flash here uh, the contribution of the important people who have done a lot of the work. This uh, is the list of collaborators for both talks and I'll flash it again uh, at the end of the second talk. But today I've only focused on these two top, these two upper panels here what will come in the second talk will be the one uh, shown in the bottom right. And with this, I'll stop now and basically uh, take some questions. Thank you, Professor Jacobi. That was a great talk. So uh, we have a few questions uh, asked during the talk I didn't got to ask you. So the first one is uh, are the contact doping the sample. Yes, so that, that's a very good point. Uh, so at first, we engineer the regions near the contacts to have this new equals two region. 
Later on, we realize that the contacts themselves increase the density in their vicinity, and we don't really need to have a separate gated region that will increase the density near the contacts. That happens naturally. So in fact, the experiments become much easier. I see. Uh, also from Chun-Li, uh, why is the conductance at one-third smaller than two-thirds? So, uh, so at, so, okay, the details whether the change in conductance is up or down has to do with the geometry. And uh, what I was showing are results not necessarily from the same sample. So remember, whether conductance increases or decreases depends on whether magnons get absorbed in one corner or another corner. So in principle, when you start from one third, uh, imagine the system doing exactly the same experiment, this two terminal experiment, uh, where now the bulk is at one third. And once your bias exceeds Zeeman, there are some processes which we don't really understand between edge states, uh, fractional edge states now, that would launch magnons in the bulk. And whether the conductance at one third, for example, will go up or down depends on the geometry. If you do the same experiment with the bulk as at two thirds, uh, again, the conductance will start off at two thirds and either will go up or down depends on geometry. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is uh, for which kind of magnetic system is Cattell law for magnet density of state valid? Uh, so typically, uh, the Cattell the Cattell law would be uh, valid for a system that uh, so in in bulk magnets it's going to be well it general it's valid generally the this specific Cattell law that I've outlined would be one where uh, the magnetization is actually in the plane of the system uh, and uh, there is some anisotropy in the plane of the system. But in a 3D magnet, uh, the, like the one that I'm showing here, where there is actually magnetization is not important and the dipolar fields that have to do with spin-spin interaction are extremely weak then it would be valid, but it, it's kind of an uninteresting law. It's basically given by G mu B, just the bare Zeeman. And you can understand why, because again, the K equals zero excitation is one where all the spins are pointing in the same direction. And when you excite them, they all bend in a uniform way. And that means that the angle between the spins is always zero. And there's only a very long wavelength texture and the only cost associated with that texture is the fact that the spins are no longer precisely along the magnetic field. And that's why it costs Zeeman. But there's no interaction energy that comes in. I see. Uh, John Weissman asks, why is the new equal zero transport extend beyond the boundary of the new equal zero state? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good it's a good region. What happens at the transition here? I think John is referring to this region here where you might have a coexistence a little bit of nu equals one physics and nu equals zero physics. So again, we have very little understanding of what's going on uh, beyond all ideal cases. So, you know, even, even our claim of what we think is going on at nu equals zero, you know, it's, it's an interpretation. This is the experimental observation. Um, but whether it's precisely what I've interpreted or not is an open question. We don't know. Uh, but certainly as you, uh, this is also true when you look at the transition from nu equals one to nu equals two. In fact, we see that the magnon generation, uh, even though you've started to form the transition and transport between nu equals one and nu equals two, you can still see bulk propagation of magnons, uh, despite the fact that the, the quantum Hall physics is, is changing already as you're transitioning from one to two. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a few questions myself uh, before I read the next question from the audience. So uh, you said the gap changes when you have magnons, you, when you exact magnons in the, in the sample. My understanding would be the magnon mode is always present in the sample, right? So when you probe, why does it matter if there's actual magnons in the sample regarding to the gap you have in the uh, scanning ICT environment? Well, so, okay, so this is kind of a, a, a topic that we've been having, you know, probably already 20 hours of conversation with Bert Halpern about this. And, uh, and you know, it, 
a, a lot a lot to learn and understand. So so let me say the following. Imagine that I have only very long wavelength magnons in the system. So if the system has only long wavelength magnons, it doesn't really matter. And the energy to add, you know, the, the, the SET is measuring the energy to add one more electron to the system. So it's compressibility. Right. Uh, and so regardless of if I have kind of long wavelength magnons, the energy to add the next electron will still have to have the opposite spin, or if there are skirmions will be a skirmionic state and will not care about the fact that there are many magnons that are long wavelength. But if I have a lot of short wavelength magnons, you see that now what happens is that the spin of the electrons within a distance of order magnetic length are no longer parallel. And so this system is already, you know, when you want to add an electron, it's necessarily going to, going to be kind of, it's not going to be precisely perpendicular. And already you're going to be diminishing the gap because you have a lot of short wavelength magnetic excitations. So it really depends on which magnons you have in the system. I see. Uh, so from uh, Zhang Zhijiang, uh, could there be a ferromagnetic, anti ferromagnetic domain structures? If so, how would the magnon propagate be propagation be impacted? Uh, so, so there is, you know, there is a phase boundary between, you know, if you if you have a system between nu equals zero and nu equals one. Uh, then yes, these are two very different magnetically ordered state. And just like if you had a magnet that had two phases or two um, ferromagnetic domains, then at the interface, there is a domain wall. You can think of it that way. Uh, and, and how the spins are converting from one direction to the other has to do with the domain wall energy, etc. So this is what I was trying to show when discussing uh, this, uh, let's see. Yeah, discussing this barrier here. So this barrier is effectively the domain wall now between the nu equals zero antiferromagnetic phase and the nu equals one ferromagnetic phase. There is a domain wall here. You see how the spins need to arrange themselves going from their order on the nu equals one pointing along the magnetic field direction to the canted phase where now they're in the plane. They need to rotate. And that's the domain wall, basically. Let's see. So uh, does the correlated gap decrease uniformly in the sample? I'm not sure what I mean, but... Uh... <laughs> Well, I think it might be related to what we just talked about uh, to a question that you asked, Shoman, uh, that is that if you have long wavelength excitation, then the correlated gap in the system will not be diminished. But if we believe that if you have short wavelength magnons, then that gap will diminish. And in fact, the picture is probably even much more complex than that. Uh, but I, I, I don't have you know, it, it's going to take an entire talk to kind of give the full context of what are the possibilities of um, uh, that could diminish the gap. But these are at least two simple scenarios that one will, you know, if you're dominated by long wavelength magnons, they're not going to reduce the gap, but short wavelength magnons will affect the gap. So uh, I guess the question is, does it decrease uniformly in a sample? Like, does it depend on where you measure it? Okay, yes. So when you measure this compressibility gap, uh, then uh, when you're far in the bulk, you don't see a big position dependence, but as you're approaching the boundaries where the contacts are, where you're generating and absorbing magnons, then yes, you see a change in this compressibility gap. Mm -hmm. So does it increase towards the eye? Is that, is that... Not, as, not just the physical edge, it increases towards the places where the magnons are generated or absorbed. Okay. So the, there, there is more things. There is a change in this compressibility gap as you move towards these points where the magnon density likely is very large because that's where you're sourcing and right. uh, absorbing magnons. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, for another question from John again: Is it possible to distinguish whether the spin transport is diffusive or ballistic? Uh, so yes, I I think. Um, well, I would say there's diffusive, there's ballistic, and maybe there's superfluid as well. Uh, and I think that um, it, it's, it's not easy 
you know, if I were, if I wanted to distinguish between even, uh, dif you know, diffusive, ballistic, and superfluid, I would say that increasing the distance of the sample. So a characteristic of the superfluid spin flow would be that you should get uh, the spin currents will decay very little with distance, basically. Uh, and so if, if I were, was able to do this experiment and increase the length over which I'm probing the propagation of these bulk magnons, if it's a superfluid state, I should see very little change. Um, I need to think about the ballistic limit, but if it's diffusive, it's clearly going to decay uh, for, because you know it's basically I have a bigger spin resistance, if you like. And so for the same chemical potential imbalance that I create uh, at the generation site, I'm going to have very little current or diminishing amounts of current as I increase the length, whereas uh, for the spin superfluid state, it's going to diminish very little. There are nice theory theoretical predictions about this by Yaroslav Tserkovniak predicting how the spin currents should decay in the limit of the superfluid phase and non-superfluid phase uh, in thin ferromagnets, which this would apply to. Uh, their theory was not specific for the quantum hall ferromagnets. Uh, I guess I'm a little confused because uh, charge current, even if it's not superfluid, it, like charge current still conserve when it propagate, right? And you say the spin current will decay. How how, how do I answer? Yes, well, so the, the question is what it is that you're sourcing. Are you sourcing a current or are you sourcing a, a chemical potential? So mm -hmm. what you know is that if you source, uh, if you source a, a voltage, then as a function of distance, the current is going to decay because your resistance increases. Uh, whereas uh, if you have a superfluid state, that's not going to happen. Uh, so, so the question is really what the boundary conditions are. Typically, the boundary conditions are boundary conditions of chemical potential when you're injecting spins and not current. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so the current will decay. In fact, it's predicted to decay exponentially uh, for the diffusive case. Uh, and um, I don't remember precisely the details of why that is, but it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a paper from, uh, I think, maybe five or six years ago uh, by Yaroslav Tsarkovniak from uh, UCLA. I see. Uh, so you also mentioned the charge excitation gap is uh, the exchange gap. How, how do we understand that? That the charge excitation gap is the exchange gap? Yeah, because uh, if you, so if you have a full Landau level and you want to add one more electron to, to the full Landau level, uh, now you have to occupy an electron that has the opposite spin. So not only do I need to pay the Zeeman energy associated with the energy separation between the bare Landau levels, now this electron is going to strongly overlap all these other electrons because there is no longer a Pauli uh, principle that forbids that. And so that energy is the exchange energy that you will have to pay. Um, Typically, you can lower this energy by not flipping one spin, but actually flipping many spins. And you can have, uh, these are the skirmionic textures that carry a charge of E. And you could lower this exchange energy by as much as half of the total exchange energy, but it's still given by an exchange energy scale. So nice. even if you flip many, many, many spins, the minimum energy that you might expect to pay for a very large skirmion would be half of the exchange gap. But you know, typically the exchange gap could be a factor of 20 or more greater than the bare Zeeman. Bare Zeeman is, is a tiny energy scale. Right. Okay, let's uh, thanks Professor Jacobi again, and we will conclude the first session in the afternoon. We will come back uh, to 